It is all too easy for newcomers to my channel to arrive at the mistaken conclusion that I am a bastion of optimism and a limitless source of light-hearted positivity, especially when it comes to the current state of the video game industry. It's a completely understandable mistake to make, given my jocular nature, almost relentless tirade of bleak, pessimistic cynicism and the years of reporting on the dishonesty, fraudulence and abuses of an industry where most corporations could best be described as degenerate. Maybe it's just my radiant personality, or the fact I was optimistic about a video game. Once. However, it concerns me that the current state of pessimism in gaming is reaching fever pitch, with many people assuming that the best days are behind us and our gaming future is a choice between live service shitshow pay to loot games and withdrawing from video games as a recreational activity altogether. I still believe there is a third choice. Periodically I read a comment or a DM that goes something like this. Are there actually any good games out there? Or a sentiment to that effect? And I usually respond with something like, Yes, people are still making good games. One day, I will make a video about it. Well, just to prove to my critics that I don't lie about absolutely everything, here it is. Despite most publishers degenerating into kiddie gambling emporiums, monetization mobile app specialists, and frankly, a propaganda wing of progressive woke ideology, there are still good games you can buy and good games being made. Not that many, but enough that even I can stop being fucking miserable for a few minutes and cobble together a list before going back to my daily chores. And by chores, obviously, I mean wanking and shitposting on Amber Heard videos. So here are some games, some old, some new, some borrowed, and also a little advice on how to get them on the cheap. Most of you will have heard some or nearly all of what follows before, but I wanted to update this into one new video which hopefully will have at least one useful recommendation for everyone. Some of these suggestions may be more or less relevant based on your tolerance for playing slightly older games. There are three games in the Metro series. The first might feel a bit dated and clunky for some. The latest Metro Exodus is a recent release. Whether you play all three or just the most recent is a matter of personal taste and preference. Similarly, Skyrim is positively creaking at the joints these days, but if you don't mind slightly older games, or perhaps like using mods, it is still very playable. It's still got an average of about 3,000 people playing online today, so it can't be totally shit. Despite what people regularly tell me in the comments section, Seriously, I really loved Skyrim. I thought it could even be peak Bethesda. But yes, I am aware some people hate it. But you might not. I also want to apologise to any of my brethren who are solely gaming on PlayStation. Whilst these suggested games themselves might be of interest to you, nearly all of my advice is based on Steam and Xbox Game Pass, which by its very nature is entirely PC and Xbox centric. Sorry about that. If anyone has any good advice for sourcing PlayStation games on the cheap, or any good suggestions for sourcing cheap games full stop, please let us know in the comments section and I will be very grateful. Just please don't hype G2A. Yes, I know they are cheap games, but their incredibly questionable business model and methods for acquiring keys are very harmful to indie developers. And that is a sector of the video game industry that we need to thrive. Before we strip bollock naked and jump into this mud wrestling pit, I thought I would just share my tried and true tactics for getting good games on the cheap. Obviously it goes without saying, never pre-order, never buy at launch, always wait at least a few weeks. Never and I mean never break these previous rules because you decided to trust an access journalist game reviewer. That's a posh way of saying, if someone releases a review on launch day or before, 
then they got an early access copy of the game, ergo they are at best engaged in a relationship with the publisher, and at worst getting a big fat fucking paycheck for promoting the game. Think I'm full of shit? Well I'm a fucktard, I have a tiny channel and I constantly bang on about corruption in the video game industry and I got offered a couple of grand this fucking week to promote a very, very shit video game. A lot of money is changing hands in the video game community. Advertising cash is being flung like monkey shit at mainstream gaming news sites. Bribes are being flung like monkey shit at YouTubers. Science fact. The best reviews are user reviews and don't believe any of this shit about, and I quote, review bombing. I am not convinced that review bombing is technically a real thing. If tens of thousands of people shit on a game in reviews because they are that angry about it, it's not because of some fiction. If everyone is that pissed off, then find out why before getting your wallet out. So, Steam Sales. Recently I bought a ton of games in the Steam Summer Sale and the job lot all came in at under 50 quid. That's about $60 in Freedom Pounds, $78 in Canadian Government Dollars, providing Justin Blackface Trudeau hasn't shut down your bank account and frozen your assets because he's a dangerous totalitarian fascist bastard liar. My point is that Trudeau is a danger to civil society and secretly planning to ban private gun ownership and almost as importantly, on PC you need to manage your Steam wishlist. My Steam wishlist is one of my habitual mechanisms for securing constant cheap discounted finished video games. At any point I always have at least 100 games on my wishlist. There are random Steam sales all the damn time, games randomly put themselves on sale for promotion or celebrations, and there are plenty of games I won't risk 30 or 40 quid on but I will happily wait on until I get lucky with a flash sale or a steam Christmas sale, so 6 to 24 months later I can snapple them up for up to 85% discount. And obviously that's not necessarily 85% discount on launch day prices. If a game is £50 on launch day then a year later the price is dropped by half and then it's on sale for 40% discount, anyone with even basic maths knowledge can work out that this comes to 20... 1? 14? Uh, 7 pounds? Around 7 and a quarter pounds. It's certainly a lot less than 50 quid. Keep your Steam wish list constantly up to date and your fucking wallet firmly padlocked to your chastity belt. Wait for notifications or check in once or twice a week. Keep some money kept back for the regular sales like Christmas and summer sale. Seriously, you can get three to five times as much value for money in exchange for demonstrating some self-control, patience and organisation. Xbox Game Pass has quickly become one of the single most pro-gamer and pro-consumer video game services on the market. At the current price point of about 10 to 11 pounds all in, in the UK at least, the Xbox Game Pass is a no-brainer on PC or Xbox and currently represents the cost efficient way to have access to a shit ton of games for so little money it practically represents an act of charity, bordering on the philanthropic. Naturally, given the state of corporate morality these days, this automatically means that I'm assuming that Game Pass is part of some long con and that Microsoft have some kind of extended long term plan for entirely fucking us all and seizing control of the publishing sector and then turning into something worse than Activision. And I'm talking Activision on a day where Bobby Kotick has got up with a cocaine hangover, accidentally takes Cialis instead of aspirin and he's going to sack the first 10 people he sees just to give himself something to wank about over breakfast. Allegedly. Look, make the most of Game Pass whilst it lasts. I'm sure it's some kind of long con. I'm sure the inevitable rug pulling exercise is in the planning. 
I'm sure Xbox pretending to be the good guys is precisely that. Pretending. But fuck it. Whilst it's still 10 quid for endless free games, even I'm doing it. I took a look at it recently, and here are some games that you can download and play. All of which I rate as decent, some of which I've highly recommended in the past. Obviously, games may differ by territory. Medieval Dynasty, Dishonored 1 and 2, Tropico 6, Everspace 2, Fallout 4, all the Halo series, Age of Empires series, Alien Isolation, Aliens Fireteam Elite, Breath Edge, Goat Simulator, Forza Horizon 4 and 5, Generation Zero, Outer Wilds, Subnautica, The Yakuza series, Wasteland 1 Remastered, and Wasteland 2 and 3. Phoenix Point, without all the epic game store fuckery. There are even a fuck ton of those murdering games made by those rape enablers. The ones that shut down support on half of their back catalogue recently, basically ripping off all their long term loyal customers. The name of the company escapes me. Uh, ah, oh yes, Ubisoft. And if you go full retard and get Xbox Game Pass with the EA games included, there is even more free shit. All the old Battlefield games. The good ones, before they uh, <clears throat> transitioned. Xbox Game Pass has got to the point now that there's so much free shit to play that I routinely check there first before ponying up cash to buy any game. Sure, some of the games will only be on there for a limited time, but at least you get to play them and decide later if you're going to buy them in a sale or pass altogether. Basically, if you own a PC or an Xbox and you get Xbox Game Pass, at the current price point, you will literally struggle not to get your money's worth every month. Even if you're just trying out old games you missed or new titles you would never pay for, it's basically Netflix for gaming right now. <laughs> I mean that very literally. It's only about a tenner a month. Sure, most of the content is a bit shit, but there's always something that's worth checking out. Okay, Game Pass is actually better than Netflix. Fuck, I had to literally stop looking through the decent games on Game Pass or the list for this video would have gotten ridiculous. So, I guess I'd better get on with my updated list of recommendations. Honourable Mentions Essentially, these are games that I have not played myself or have not played enough of to have an authoritative opinion, but people whose opinions I do trust keep mithering me to play them. So due diligence is advised but the following games come highly recommended. Kenshi Generation Zero Outer Wilds Dyson Sphere Program Although a word of caution, Dyson Sphere is published by a Chinese company, so sadly any and all personal information you share with them becomes the property of Winnie the Pooh. Caution is advised. And I wholeheartedly recommend that if you do buy Dyson Sphere, you do so through a reputable intermediary platform like Steam or the Xbox Store, and do not give them any of your personal data, ever. Let's talk old staples. For those of you who follow the channel, you are by now painfully aware of some of my favourite games, which I constantly bang on about and repeatedly recommend. But since you're here, and some of you might be new, here are some old staples that are still golden. Kingdom Come Deliverance, one of the best hardcore slash survival first person historic action adventure games ever made. If you like smashing people's heads in with a fucking mace, atmospheric storytelling, and tits, accept no substitute. Kingdom Come Deliverance is a sort of game where you can spend half your time wading around in pig shit and the other half of your time in brothels, polishing your armour until you've buffed that shit right out. Obviously, you spend lots of time bludgeoning people to death as well, but that's a given. Buy this game, buy all the DLC, fuck, go to Wolfland Armoury and buy the fucking sword. Deep Rock Galactic The most fun you can have in a bar full of dwarves with all your clothes on. Or off. 
It's a single player or co-op survival mission based mining simulator with tactical beardage. It's cheap fun which you can enjoy solo and equally it might become one of your favourite Friday night co-op games with mates. I could wax lyrical about Deep Rock Galactic for hours, but I already did that recently so go and watch my review. It is a rare example of a game that is ethically, creatively and commercially impeccable. Remnant from the Ashes This third person adventure shooter is incredibly unique in both its form and creative design. It was a genuine what the fuck moment in 2019 when this semi budget game came out and bowled everyone over. It's strange, beautiful, violent and interesting and it's also infinitely replayable. Frostpunk The post apocalyptical Great Reset Simulator Imagine a world plunged into an ice age by some random thing. Imagine being in charge of an outpost desperately trying to generate heat and food. Imagine treating your population like disposable serfs and ruling them with an iron rod. Imagine casually consigning hundreds of people to death because you can't be arsed with insulating their houses. Imagine if lots of people die just because you're an incompetent fuckwit. Imagine how hard Klaus Schwab would be masturbating over this game if he ever read the product description on Steam. We are in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution, which accelerates global change in much more comprehensive and faster ways than the previous three revolutions. He would love this shit. You're basically in charge of everyone, they are entirely reliant on you for food and housing, everyone has to work for free just to survive, and you make up the rules as you go along. The plebs owe nothing, and they are presumed to be happy. Obviously, just like the real Great Reset, it comes as a shock when everyone gets so pissed off with your shit leadership and abuses of power that they rebel and cast you out into the freezing wastes to die. But them's the breaks, I guess. Frostpunk is a brutal RTS survival city sim where you basically pitch your planning and management skills against the plunging, freezing temperatures. In a race against time where you can quite literally end up killing swathes of your population solely by virtue of bad governance. That's becoming quite the theme these days. Valheim You are dead. That's always a good start. At least you get to check out the Viking equivalent of Purgatory, where in order to impress your gods and move on up to Valhalla, you must explore, build little bases, kill bosses, explore more, build even more bases, cut down trees on an industrial scale, gripe about how shit the new terrain mechanics are. See, I can't stop myself. I may have made a scathing video about the devs nerfing the terrain mechanics, which they did to fix frame rate issues and it fucking failed, but Valheim is still spectacular. If there was a metric for how many potential hours play you can get per pound, this game would have a huge one. You can play Valheim solo or in co-op mode, it's an absolute no-brainer. Red Dead Redemption 2 Red Dead Redemption 2 single player campaign is still one of the best single player experiences on the market. Whilst everyone seems to delight in pointing out this game's flaws, it is still without doubt one of the best games made in recent years and ticks all my boxes when it comes to content, activities and themes. By that I mean it's got prostitutes, it's got hunting, skinning and crafting, it's got a fishing minigame, it's got murderizing and thuggery. This game will have you trudging around knee deep in sludge for hours just in order to hunt beaver. Or not only will you do it, but you will enjoy doing it. Red Dead Redemption 2 is a timeless classic, available on all platforms, even if the PC port, key binding mechanics are more dysfunctional and disappointing than a frying pan made out of frozen dog shit. Death Stranding Yeah, I said it. And I said it because I'm one of the weirdos that finds Death Stranding strangely relaxing and enjoyable despite its weird piss bombs, OCD game loop and biblical levels of parcel delivery. 
This game is for people with very specific tastes, and probably at least one or two personality disorders. At 4.05 p.m., a 100,000-pound Comet Liner 2 stainless steel car ran into a man at the Braxton station. Luckily, there was no structural damage caused to the car's chassis, so it was only a matter of cleaning the train to remove the human debris and return it to a pristine state. Oh, just a terrible accident, Michael. No, Brooke. This was a very lucky day for the train. I'm sure, if you're an Amazon delivery driver or a postie, this game might be fucking traumatising for you. But for those of us who never go outside and see daylight, Death Stranding is basically the best delivery driver slash taking a walk in the countryside simulator ever made. And FYI, there are also bombs made out of your own shit. And I'm talking about actual real exploding bombs made out of feces. It's not just like flinging turds at people like we all might do normally. Fallout 4 Possibly the last true Bethesda game that was not mired in fuckery and cuckery. Fallout 4 was, for me, a great experience. This game will mean different things to different people, and its appeal will largely be determined by your appetite for scavenging and base building. I am weirdly obsessed with it, so for me Fallout 4 was a network settlement sim, with a fully storied RPG thrown into the mix. Possibly the last Bethesda game that truly had that Bethesda slash Fallout magic, and some of the game's side quests and story arcs really capture this. Maybe Fallout 4 foreshadowed the shit direction Bethesda were heading in by introducing a modding shop, charging for irrelevant skins and paywalling some of the base building behind DLC, but foreshadowing is not necessarily the same as spoiling and if you pick up Fallout 4 Game of the Year Edition in a sale, well you can't really go wrong. Unless you hate base building and you have a low tolerance for bugs. If that is the case, then you have probably just royally fucked up. Skyrim Loved by many, hated by some. Memed by literally everyone. Skyrim is still a wonderful game to play on the cheap, if you have never tried it. Pick berries, ride on your horsey, get stamped on by giants, explore endless amounts of generic crypts. It might not be perfect, it might be partially procedurally generated, apparently, but I loved this game and got lost in its strange, obsessive, huge world for months. What can I say that has not already been said? If you're watching this video, you've probably already played Skyrim, but if you have not, then you should possibly consider it. Just don't play it and then get really excited about the sequel. Little Todd Howard will no doubt fuck that right up. But now it's time for the main course. Some new recommendations. Well, at least some of these are new-ish. Based on a combination of personal experience and my scanning of Xbox Game Pass, the following game seemed like a safe bet for anyone wanting to kill a fair amount of time playing a semi-decent game, some of which will require very minimal financial outlay. The Tropico series. Are you some kind of fucking communist? Doesn't matter. This is a Banana Republic despot simulator. It's like someone collided a city sim with everything hilarious about third world dysfunctional dictatorships. I have played some, but not all but any of the relatively recent ones will most likely do. Get one on sale, or even play the latest for free on Game Pass. Ingenious, amusing and infuriating in equal measure. You have to manage your economic infrastructure whilst balancing the needs of your pesky, ungrateful peon population of complaining bastards with your own needs for control freakery, ego maintenance and political leanings. Be a capitalist, be a socialist, be a brutal oppressor. It matters not. You pick your particular flavour of societal abuse and get busy failing at it. It's a funny, entertaining video game about being a third world dictator. So two thumbs up from me, right there. And next time some ignorant, ill-informed whinging Nancy claims that FPS shooters cause people to do mass shootings, just look them in the eye and say, well, hundreds of thousands of people played Tropico 6, 
Name one of them that became a third world dictator. Hard Space Shipbreaker There are a few primal aspects of the human psyche from which I take great solace. For example, most people have the capacity for kindness and compassion. Everybody likes porn. And smashing shit up is hilarious. Seriously, everyone loves demolishing things, breaking things and generally destroying shit. Science fact. Well, Hard Space Shipbreaker is slightly more sophisticated than that, because sadly, you have to try and destroy the ship surgically and salvage the component parts. But it's still technically smashing shit up, so it's not a complete bust. Hard Space is to spaceship demolition what Death Stranding is to parcel delivery. It's a subtly humorous dystopian space demolition sim where you effectively work to pay off your life-crushing corporate debts that bond you to your life as an indentured servant. It's basically the kind of future we might all be living in soon if we don't stop mega corporations and global elites from entirely taking over civic governance and turning us all into a slave population that is born into debt. I only recently started playing this game so I'm not an expert, but it is obsessive, thoughtful, fun and as kindly suggested to me, it's worth reading every note, contract and detail because the devil really is in the detail in this game. It's an extremely sardonic take on our potential corporate future and I will be reviewing it soon. Maybe the pace will be a bit too chilled out for some people, possibly a little OCD might be required to fully appreciate this little gem, but I am personally really enjoying it. You know how a serial killer methodically cuts up the body and sorts and separates all the organs, body parts, the skin and hair and neatly organises them all into different jars and containers so they can keep the right parts as souvenirs and use the other bits for making dresses and dolls? Of course you do. Hard Space is exactly like that only you're doing it to a spaceship and sorting all the parts for salvage. They really should let me write the little product descriptions on Steam. Days Gone Do you remember the good old days when games are about manly men and womanly women with good old fashioned values of bravery, sacrifice and stoicism? When the world was more Ellen Ripley than uh, angry and bitter. Well, Days Gone gives you a bike, a club and some jeans that are frankly in desperate need of a good service wash and sets you off on a journey across post-apocalyptic Oregon. Not the current post-apocalyptic hellscape that we see today, the one in the near future that is slightly less dysfunctional and not quite as bad. Watch my review. Days Gone is one of the most underrated games out there and a perfect example of woke mainstream journalists effectively burying an excellent game because it did not take the proverbial knee. Chernobylite Polish video game development at its finest Personally, I love radiation. Why wouldn't I? Radiation is pretty, it makes things glow and it can heal your skeletal structure. That's why they fire x-rays at people when they've broken a bone. Everyone knows that. Well, this is a first person, semi openish worldish RPG-ish, storied action adventure, survival-ish base building-ish video game-ish. Set in a warped sci-fi reality, drawing from the Chernobyl mythos. It's bleak, atmospheric, sometimes shit the bed scary, a bargain and made by a developer I want to see more games from. It's a pretty fucking dark affair if I'm being completely honest, so if you spend more than an hour a day playing Candy Crush and you think that Fall Guys is edgy PvP combat, then this might not be for you. Chernobylite is a dark journey, but it's worth taking. Medieval Dynasty This game is the most entertainment you can have rolling around in shit all day. In fact, I've rarely seen a game so obsessed with animal and human excrement outside of my hentai game collection. You smear it on walls, collect it from pigs, make manure with it, 
so it's no wonder that being a filthy dirty bastard is actually a stat in this medieval town building simulator. This game won't be for everyone, and it's very slow and uncompromising. I'm serious. On my first playthrough I literally froze to death alone in the winter, in a small log cabin, with wolves outside. It was like The Revenant, but more depressing, and with less excitement. But if you are into very hardcore survival town building sims, with lots of running, not that much story, and a very slow pace, this will fill that hole. It's a bit rough around the edges, but if you played Kingdom Come Deliverance and thought, I like this game, but I wish it was slower paced and had less quality of life concessions, then this might be for you. I actually enjoyed my 10 or so hours playing, but then again, I'm strange. Metro Exodus I like all the Metro games, but I really liked this one. You drop into the shoes of Artyom, a survivor of an end of day scenario who is obsessed with respirators, killing and tinkering with homemade improvised weapons. I think that me and Artyom would have a lot to talk about down the pub. The games are based on the now legendary series of science fiction books by Russian author and political fugitive Dmitry Glukovsky. Glukovsky was added to the Russian Federal Wanted list in June after protesting the Russian invasion of Ukraine on Instagram. You would think that someone who has made a career from writing about the aftermath of nuclear war might know a thing or two about the subject, but sadly, in Russia, just like in the UK and several other apparently developed nations and third world shitholes, you can now get arrested and face jail time for airing your entirely moderate opinions in public. Well that should be a warning to us all. Metro Exodus basically flirts in the no man's land between an open world game and a mission based game. A bit like Gears 5 now I come to think about it. Only unlike Gears 5, I would highly recommend Metro Exodus, because it's vastly more engaging, you get to ride on a choo choo train, and I simply adored the hand cranked flashlight. How cool is that? Dying Light 2 I like looking at Rosario Dawson's ass, and so I should. Oh, and she's in this game, that's why I mentioned it, but I probably would have brought it up anyway. I actually rate this game despite it not particularly excelling at anything. It's a bit like the Glock pistol of video games. There's no single aspect that is truly original or particularly amazing, but the whole package combined is well put together and results in an incredibly serviceable end result. It's an open world RPG light action adventure parkour based zombie noncing around adventure game, and frankly it's quite fun to play and it's an interesting enough world to explore, even if you have to jump around on everything like one of those parkour fellas from the faceplant videos. It might sound like I have a downer on this game, but I don't. If this game has a fault, it's that it merely excels at being a decent all round game that honours the unwritten contract between developer and gamer. The moral contract, not like the modern Bethesda and Ubisoft contracts, where you quite literally agree to let them sell you nothing, give them the right to take it away anyway, and then melt your computer because of their technical fucking incompetence. Dying Light 2 is a perfectly acceptable and enjoyable way to waste a lot of time, whilst copying furtive looks at Rosario Dawson's enchanting mo capped attributes. Rage 2 A much underappreciated open world road warrior pootling around simulator from Avalanche Studios and id Software. Avalanche Studios are the dudes and dudettes behind Mad Max and Generation Zero, and id Software have a long and venerable legacy of making these little platform puzzle games that the kids absolutely love. I think it's because all the bright flashing lights on the screen gets them excited, like when you wiggle string in front of a cat. Probably something to do with dopamine. Rage 2 excels at nothing and succeeds at everything. It's just a good old fashioned road warrior game where you potal around, kill dudes, upgrade your vehicle and generally spend time appreciating how nice it is just to ride around 
explore, soak up the beautiful scenery, whilst occasionally slamming your car into people at 100 miles an hour because watching idiots go splat frankly never gets old. If you like the Mad Max game, you will most likely thoroughly enjoy this. Age of Empires 4 Notably, it's currently free to play on Xbox Game Pass. Age of Empires 4 is exactly what it says on the tin. It's another Age of Empires game. It has a single player campaign of sorts and single player against AI and single or co-op online competitive play. If you played Starcraft or Command and Conquer, watched Braveheart and have a vague understanding of medieval warfare, then Age of Empires is a relaxing and stress-free way to pass the time of day. Personally, I love this style of game because I can sit there with my mouse in one hand, my beer in the other, and merrily engage in some low effort mouse clicking whilst gleefully reveling in the carnage playing out on my screen. It's like playing artillery in World of Tanks basically, only with Age of Empires 4, people don't DM me after matches and threaten to rape my father and murder my mother. Humorously, Age of Empires 4 also perfectly illustrates a fundamental truth about war. Copious amounts of peasants are both your most powerful and useful resource in the game, and they are also the most expendable, easily abused, and frequently are abandoned and left to die pointlessly, <laughs> because they're cheap to recruit and replace, but nevertheless do 95% of the useful work. So basically it's just like real war. The entire Bioshock series still immensely playable after all these years. A definitive part of gaming cultural history, fully remastered, and in a proper way, not a GTA way. This is considered by some to be a seminal sci-fi noir, art deco influenced, retro futuristic masterpiece. Although the last one in the series is often seen as being a bit weak. Possibly even woke. Play it through and you will end up seeing Bioshock's influences in many other games afterwards, like everything that Arcane Studios has ever done since contracting to do work on Bioshock 2. Just saying. I mean, you can see the influence, right? Frankly, if you're into video games and you've not played the Bioshock series, I would consider it a personal fucking duty. Dishonored 1 and 2 Talking of Arcane Studios, art and design palette being chock full of art deco furniture, retro futuristic technology, and mouse over tooltips about trying to make it look like that other game. The Dishonored franchise is still worth playing though, although I know this is going to be a hard sell. Dishonored 1 and 2 can now be played on Xbox Game Pass for free. That's a good starting point. You see, I actually liked Dishonored 1, but then gave up on Dishonored 2 after playing through about a core of the game. And there is a story behind all of this. Dishonored very much marketed itself as a thief-like stealth game, but really it's not. It's got the steampunk aesthetics and the marketing, but really it's more of a traditional first-person stealth shooter, only you're armed with crossbows, knives and Harry Potter skills. It's not a bad game, it's just not the hot shit it's cracked up to be. Dishonored 2, it turns out, was heavily influenced by, wait for it, Anita Sarkeesian. When Arcane got a second bite at the apple, they did precious flying fuck all about it but fire a fucking vagina at you, which I suppose is to be expected for a company that admittedly approached Anita Sarkeesian for gender representation advice. I was one of some voices that were very critical of Dishonored 1. Right. Um, it, it, while it was a really impressive game, it wasn't so good to women. Um, and so it was such a treat to see Dishonored 2 come out and, you know, you can play as Emily, the marketing was Emily, it was just this big push and it was very clear that there was at least some conversation that happened internally around that. Uh, we internally sat down, well, your comment, which I will always remember, I'll take it to my grave, it was something like, while Ga Dishonored is a game that does many things very well, uh, the roles that it has for women are very narrow. Anita Sarkeesian, the progressive fifth wave feminist who lied about being a gamer to get research money and then started up an even more lucrative career running a feminist video game protection racket. 
allegedly. Hypothetically, the protection racket goes something like this, in theory. Someone launches a game, like Dishonored 1. Anita Sarkeesian goes on social media and decries its sexism and misogyny. Anita Sarkeesian then offers to solve the crisis, for the developer, by offering her paid services as a consultant on future games. Instead of telling her to fuck off, the developer listens to this craziness. The developer eventually releases their next game, Dishonored 2. Surprise, sir fucking prize. It turns out to be a woke pile of flying identity political fuck. Everyone spams Twitter with Get Woke Go Broke, we all live happily ever after, only with Anita Sarkeesian being a little bit richer and gamers being all a little bit poorer because now one of their favourite franchises is fucking destroyed. So yes, technically I'm suggesting you play an average game followed by its shit sequel. But there is method to this madness. My logic here is that this is a great opportunity to experience some gaming history and the degeneracy of video game publishing first hand and in real time and for free. And no, I don't expect you to finish the second game, although it's nowhere near as bad as people say. It's still pretty fucking bad. <laughs> but on Xbox Game Pass you can play both games for free, probably quite enjoy the first and then quit halfway through the second and it won't cost you a penny. You might have quite a lot of fun and you get to see a direct before and after comparison to see exactly what happens to a franchise when a video game hating ultra feminist grifter gets to run amok with a video game IP. It's like a before and after reveal on a makeover show, only instead of getting made up, the person gets beaten up. Think of it as being like a video game science experiment, where Dishonored 1 is the bit where all the rats are jumping around happily, squeaking and looking cute, and Dishonored 2 is afterwards a few hours after they've dropped the Novichok into the cage. What have you got to lose apart from about 50 hours of your time, possibly a little dignity and self-respect? If there is one compliment I can give to the Dishonored series, it's this. They are definitely worth playing if you can do so for free. I shit you not. And that is something I can't say about Last of Us 2. Breath Edge It's Subnautica in space, apparently. You know the drill, it's a space-based survival puzzle action adventure open space-ish survival, I said survival again, asphyxiation based astronaut game. You are stranded in a little space pod after a catastrophic incident destroyed your spaceship and in order to survive you need to investigate wreckage, one gulp of air at a time. You hold your breath, you explore wreckage, you scavenge, you hold your breath again, you build more stuff, travel out further, Try not to get irradiated. Dear fucking lord, this really is Subnautica in space, isn't it? I have still not gotten around to finishing this game, but I absolutely will because it's fun, funny, and cheap. But yeah, I guess it really is Subnautica in space, as much as I hate that kind of comparison. But if you like space, asphyxiation, and games where you're trapped in a lonely and desolate, isolated life or death scenario where you are almost certainly doomed, this might be just the game to cheer you up. Subnautica Well, I guess it's only fair to call this Breath Edge in the Sea. Now this one I actually got into recently and it's a fucking diamond. You are stranded in a little space pod after a catastrophic incident destroyed your spaceship and you crash landed on an alien planet. In order to survive you need to investigate wreckage, one mouthful of air at a time. I can see a theme developing here, although at least in this instance your pod landed in the ocean so you'll be holding your breath underwater rather than in space. This is all the usual shit of every survival exploration based building scavenging game, but it's done shockingly well. Sadly, the base building mechanics are not as creative and freeform as say Valheim, but it's still all very well fleshed out, leaves some room for creative flourish despite its modular nature and the exploration of the darkest depths of the planet's oceans 
is 100% pure shart inducing terror. Not even kidding. This is a game that genuinely manages to be scary in an exciting way. It's not stress inducing terror like horror games, but it manages to be legitimately scary in a way that even I can tolerate and enjoy. You'll build little bases and staging points and upgrade your gear, find cute little fishies with cute little names and then eat them. You will dare to venture further and further out and deeper and deeper down into the depths of the hostile oceans where there be dragons. There is a reason why this game is so universally well received. I would note though that there is an issue which affects both Breath Edge and Subnautica. You know when you're watching a movie and there is some bit where the protagonist has to swim through a cave or something holding their breath and you find yourself holding your breath out of sympathy? You may find yourself doing this in both of these games. I did. I shit you not. So yeah, if you are one of those people who sympathetically holds their breath, if you pass out easily, have a brain aneurysm or you just live in an iron fucking lung, both of these games might make you pop a blood vessel in your forehead. Just saying. Void Bastards Lo-fi cartoon style adventure strategy shooter puzzle based space fuck I don't know how to describe it. But it is precisely the sort of game that is perfect for the Steam 2 hour refund policy because you really could get a good handle on what this game is all about in 119 minutes. Maybe 25 quid is a tiny bit steep for this game, maybe it isn't. One thing is for sure though, this is one of the most original games released of late and I always regret not ever having gotten round to reviewing it. It's a game with humour and originality and worth consideration. Do definitely check out some gameplay videos before purchase because it has a very idiosyncratic style that might be a bit of a Vegemite scenario. You will know what I mean when you see gameplay. It's essentially cartoon based graphics. Wasteland 3 Now I was tempted to recommend Wasteland 1 Remastered and Wasteland 2 as well, but Wasteland 3 is my personal favourite and it's the one that I have totally played to death. The others are good apparently too. I played a bit of Wasteland 2 and really liked it. I'll let you do your homework based on your tolerance of retro-ish style gaming. Your due diligence is better than my semi-informed opinions after all. But I can absolutely vouch for Wasteland 3. It's peak Wasteland, has modern quality of life enhancements, an engaging story, it is well humoured and will carry you off to one of the best retro futuristic fantasy futures that I've experienced. Wasteland 3 is the spiritual successor to the Fallout franchise, or should I say Wasteland is the spiritual precursor to the Fallout franchise. Without boring you with 30 years of video game history, Interplay and Brian Fargo made the first Wasteland game back in the day. Eventually this led to Fallout 1 and then through a series of mergers, acquisitions, companies going bust and corporate fuckery, Todd Howard eventually ruined everything for everyone because he needed to secure lots of cash in order to seize control of the world supply of leather jackets and cheap toxic merchandise. Then Brian Fargo said, fuck this for a game of soldiers, all modern games are shit, set up in exile entertainment and rebooted his own franchise, initially as a kickstarter. They are technically all worth playing, but I will give my gold standard seal of approval to Wasteland 3. And yes, they're all on Game Pass right now. Cyberpunk 2077 <laughs> Yeah, I said it. I will carry on when all the laughing has died down. I completely understand why some people would consider Cyberpunk 2077 as being problematic. Fuck, Cyberpunk was so problematic that despite personally enjoying it, my review turned into a three part video series. How about them apples? It was oversold, missold, misrepresented and it didn't actually work on a lot of last gen consoles at launch. And I mean did not actually fucking function. The allegations of deception, fraud and betrayal perpetrated by CD Projekt Red is not only a whole PhD thesis right there, 
but represents the most mighty pissing away of consumer confidence and good faith since Coca-Cola launched Dasani Mineral Water in the UK and it turned out that the premium mineral water basically came from a fucking standpipe in a dirty industrial estate just outside London and all the water was contaminated with carcinogenic bromides. Yeah, roll up, roll up. Get premium mineral water for only £2 a bottle and each one comes with free fucking cancer. Just like Del Boy, not only had Coca-Cola sold tap water in a bottle, but they sold contaminated tap water in a bottle. So yeah, CD Projekt Red is like that favourite teacher at school who suddenly ends up on the evening news because he's been arrested for kidnapping, torturing and murdering children. CDPR got sued by its own investors. Well ain't that some shit. However, on the plus side, on a PC or next gen console the experience ain't so rough if you have moderated expectations. The thing is, at launch people are expecting something else. Maybe Witcher 3 with a car. Maybe something true to the original desktop RPG. Maybe, just maybe, something vaguely similar to all that stuff that CDPR had been saying it would be for years and then factually wasn't. There is absolutely no escaping the following facts. Cyberpunk 2077 isn't the game that was advertised and hyped. It ran like shit at launch, it didn't run at all on some consoles, and apparently on last gen consoles it still runs like a fucked cat now. But I had fun on PC. Problematic fun, but a lot of fun nevertheless. Some of the game is truly exceptional. I appreciate why people are pissed off, but if you snaffle this game up in a Steam sale tomorrow for 25 quid and you like giant open world doing games with some cracking subplots and some brilliant story writing, then this is hundreds of hours of busy work entertainment and a lot of road rash based mayhem. Yeah, I get it, there is some basically broken our shit in this game, like almost completely absent police and fugitive status mechanics, and a load of other shit that got stripped out completely by launch day. But it's all relative really. If you paid 50 quid for a completely unknown title and you got this, you would be over the moon. But people thought they were getting the mythological version of Cyberpunk 2077 that had been promised to them and this certainly ain't that. I still think that this is a great game, but a lot of people have every right to be fucked off with the whole situation and cyberpunk. This game is often hated because they catfished the audience. It's like a girl who is a solid 5 out of 10 who tries really hard. There's nothing wrong with that and it's better action than I've seen this month, but if she advertised herself as a 10 and hadn't mentioned the slightly furry top lip, not that I mind, I can appreciate why someone would be upset when she turned up at their door, grinning optimistically and sporting a bit of a tash. I might have a spectacularly high tolerance of open world fuck around games with lots of fetch quests and crafting, and girls with tashes, but despite all its flaws and fuckery, it's still a decent amount of game for your money. It's a positive steal at 50% discount and you can sleep with prostitutes. Perhaps I should have led with that. Buy Cyberpunk 2077 when it's on discount. It has prostitutes. And a shop that sells sex toys. The end. I really felt I needed to make this video because some people legitimately think that I don't like any games and more significantly a lot of people are giving up on gaming as a hobby because they're losing hope of finding decent games to play themselves and they're getting fucked off with spending money on games that turn out to be complete scams or piles of shit. Well these suggestions encompass games published right across the last decade with many released in the last 18 months, so I reckon there are plenty of reasons to be optimistic, even if there is a massive overrepresentation of post-apocalyptical games. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure a psychologist would have a field day on that one. So my apologies for uh, <coughs> my unconscious bias, but on a positive note, playing lots of post-apocalyptical games will be great training for what we will be experiencing over the coming decade. It's all win when you think about it.
I guess. At the very least, if you like video games, but you hate live service, always online, woke AAA bullshit, I hope I have at least shown that there are still good games being made out there. And even though they are making much more shit and much less quality games these days, with a bit of shopping around, a game pass, some legwork, and not a little self-discipline, there are still enough good games out there to keep us all busy for a few more years at the very least. And there are plenty of easy ways to avoid getting stung by refusing to engage in hype and launch day purchasing. I hope everyone has found at least one video game in the list that turns out to be helpful. And don't forget that you can search on my channel for reviews of some of the games I've recommended. And I'm quietly confident that people are going to leave their video game suggestions in the comment section as well. Probably along with a few statements like Skyrim's shit and fuck you for recommending Cyberpunk 2077. Oh well, at least we can take some comfort in the fact that Starfield will be out soon and that totally won't be an utter launch day fucking fiasco. But for now, good luck and happy hunting. Bye.